my name is Laura Sherman and I am the principal harpist with the Florida Grand Opera and I'm here with maestro Joseph Mekovich and uh, we're currently sitting in Fort Lauderdale, Florida and we are going to be doing our penultimate performance of La Boheme. Um, I wanted to mention before introducing um, the maestro that this video is in preparation for the American Harp Society's National Conference in Orlando in June, uh, and in particular for the orchestra audition workshop that's going to be held there. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Maestro. Um, uh, first of all, he is an internationally sought-after conductor for operas, traditional operas, and also a great proponent of American operas. He's worked all over the world, hundreds of productions, a very deep and passionate knowledge about all of them, and um, there's a quote that I found from an interview that you did um, from Classical Singer Magazine, and I'm going to read that because I really think it sums up a lot of the things that we noticed um, working with you here on Boeing. So, uh, he is the very best kind of opera conductor, a real theater man who understands the dramatic pacing is absolutely everything. He's a wonderful storyteller with a baton in hand. He loves singers, loves words, loves the stage, loves the orchestra, <laughs> and uh, forces collectively to tell compelling stories. This is definitely something that we've noticed working with you here over the past month, month or so. Um, these are just very inspiring words. We're very inspired. Thank you for taking the time and welcome. Oh, thank you so much. It's great to do this. I'm excited. Yeah, we're I'm excited, excited too. We're excited too. Thank you. Um, so first of all, you have a unique harp story that very few harpists, I believe, have even ever had. And I think it's related to your undergraduate study days at Oberlin. Yes, I went to Oberlin, yeah. Would you be willing to share Sure, that I was us? there um, uh, 81 to 87, right? That's four years. Oh, no. <laughs> anyway, I was yeah. there for four years undergrad. <laughs> Can't do math. I'm a conductor. I can only count to four. Um, at any rate, um, I was very dear friends with uh, harpist Trina Struble, who was principal at Cleveland, right out of school. She yeah. went there. We were part of this thing called the Breakfast Club. We were the first people at the dining hall with our friend Dave Stevenson, who teaches at Vanderbilt. He does elder care, uh, elder care studies. Um, anyway, we'd show up at 7 o'clock every morning, have breakfast, and immediately go to the practice room. So Trina and I were very like mine, nerds, very fun, amazing human being, and phenomenal musician. She was double degree violin and harp, um, constantly practicing and just lovely. Well, she studied with Alice Shallowflu, and I had the uh, pleasure of sneaking around when Trina was having lessons and listening through the door, and this very petite woman <laughs> with the strength of two trillion people walking around the halls and then, and now and then I've had the opportunity to come and sit in just for a couple seconds and greet her and say hello and you know it was always Trina was always so excited about having a lesson with her with the goddess herself and just so amazing to see this uh, voluminous uh, uh, um, uh, individual who knew so much about that instrument and came from so the tradition um, so it was, it was, you knew you were in the presence of someone great and every word that she would say would, was magic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think you mentioned you thought she was around 98 years old. She was super, at the time. she was around 98. And she's really, really small, she, right? So like small. tiny. Yeah, but, and, you, and you said, mm, yeah, when you, when, yeah, you, when she put her hands on the heart, yep. you said, boom. Yep, she still had the, <laughs> the flag. Like, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, as you said, she's just such an icon. Yeah. She's part of our heart history. and. For you to have met her and yeah. heard her play and heard seen her teaching that's really yeah. really special so i wanted to start with that <laughs> to get us in the mood for all things harp um and then the, so then the couple things i want to cover today so talking about the harp's role in opera in general and also of course in puccini's um Boheme, which is what we're doing right now and also um at the end if we could do, maybe if you can offer some advice for aspiring okay. opera harpists we so often, like in school and, and elsewhere, we study the symphonic repertoire in great depth. But we, at least in the harp world, we don't have as many opportunities to talk about opera. It's it's similar to playing in a symphony orchestra, but there are so many other things that go into it yeah. as well. So maybe if we could touch on some of those things. So um, so in general, let's see here. Um, actually, 
Yeah. So you've worked with many harpists and opera pits all over the world. Um, might you have any observations that you'd like to share? What kind of expectations you might have of them? Or what impresses you the most with opera harpists? Yeah, what impresses me the most is rhythmic vitality. You know, the rhythm section of the band, so much. I mean, it depends on the composer, right? Usually if he or she's a pianist, I mean, you can, you can see the fingers moving with you guys. You can see the fingers like Puccini, like J.K. Gee and Massenet. You can see their fingers moving. Um, yeah, so that rhythmic integrity. And more importantly, the most important thing is the ability to breathe. Ah, right. You know, that's what attracted me so much into, with, into working with singers, is that when I was at Oberlin, part of my scholarship was to play for singers. I'd never done that before. Uh -huh. And I fell in love with it very quickly because number one, singers are naked on stage. They don't get to hide behind a harp. They don't get to hide behind a band or a baton or I was a pianist, I am a pianist, a clarinet. They're naked. And I was very impressed by that. And everything they have to do for the most part is memorize in a variety of different languages. And then they taught, I, in those very few first months, I learned something very integral for myself, which was the idea of breathing. I used to have tons of memory slips and still struggle with that when I was doing um, uh, solo piano work. But when I started to breathe, <laughs> everything changed. And so it, it, when you're with great orchestras, when you're with great players, when they breathe together as an ensemble, and especially in opera when they breathe with the stage, yes. that's magic for the audience. Yes, it's yes. magic. Absolutely. And one thing that I noticed that you do to help facilitate that with us as players is your choice of conducting patterns. You know, when you have to subdivide, you do. But yeah. even when you do, there's still that kind of beat feel, the, the groove feel to it. And then when it's when it needs to really groove, you'll go back into the to the big beat pulse. You yeah. know? And, and, and it's just, it, it's very inspiring to play with that kind of thoughtful conducting pattern. Yeah, it's, I, ha I have this mantra that I guide myself um, through all the scores I do, which is when to accompany and when to lead. And, and then that means trusting my friends in the pit up on stage as well. Mm -hmm. And if everyone has that subdivision going on, especially Puccini, which is full of relentandos and retardandos, every trick in the book, if you lose that sense of rhythm, that pulse, it becomes an event instead of a nuance. And we lose the heartbeat of the moment, the heartbeat of the character, the sound, the vibrato, everything. Mm -hmm. We lose that if we indulge. Mm -hmm. So keeping that pulse going on, and for me, that's trusting and only subdividing when need be. You know, because everyone can count, everyone can get that pulse, and, and if we do that organically, and every, hopefully everything I do has a, 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 is related to each other in terms of the beat, mm -hmm. but it's that um, it's being organic and trusting that I try to to do on the podium. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Something else that you do that I've never experienced before, which I love, um, is you said to us early on, "Follow you, do yeah, not follow the singers." You know, even when I teach, you know, how to play in an orchestra, I'm like, yeah, an opera, you know, you kind of have to always on edge, like, do I follow the singer? Do I follow the conductor? You know, and you you just put it to put it to rest. You said, follow yeah. me, be, and the singers will follow you. Like, don't let them indulge. Or, I can't right. remember, like, the express, the, right. yeah. like, what you said I mean, to us. I want it to be my fault, not an individual's fault in the band or an individual's fault up on, on stage as well. Mm -hmm. I am obsessed with the energy between me and what's behind the proscenium or up to the proscenium. Mm -hmm. That energy has to be filled with trust. I've said that word before. Between us and the pit, I have to gain, earn your trust in the pit and earn, also have earned the trust on stage. And that is precision. That is a, uh, a, a energy of storytelling. That is the, 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 the kinetic energy that actually feeds out into the audience. If that is not there, the performance is dead. You know, to me it is, it feels dead because we're not having that idea of chair music mm -hmm. where people lean into each other in the pit, on stage, with the curtains even. Quick changes with costumes are all part of the, the storytelling in theater. Okay. And um, that is super important for me as a goal yeah. is to, I want it to be my fault. It's not that I am obsessed with leading it's just that we have a full uh, energy to fill. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That makes energy total sense. To fill. Yeah, total sense. And and as you said, you've used this word trust a couple of times. And again, I noticed that right from the beginning. When uh, the way that, especially in rehearsals, the way that you give direction, the way that you try to inspire the players to give their best, to the way that you point things out that can be better, 
first of all, you call us friends, my friend in the chat, friends in the cello section, my friend, the harpist, you know, just not in a, in a superficial way, but just in a, kind of in a, hey, we're, we're putting on a show, this is a collective thing, you know, like to earn, earn your trust. And, and it really works because you're always very respectful and the way that you share your knowledge, like, you don't just say, do it. You say, you know, do it because this is happening. And you know what I mean? So like, it just, we all feel very supported and inspired by your verbal direction and your physical direction. When I was a, a much younger, more inexperienced conductor, I was a couple of um, arrogance points away from wearing an ascot, you know, very arrogant. And I was cover conducting at Santa Fe my first year there. And I came out, I was, went to this rehearsal by a conductor, Kenneth Montgomery, who, is, who passed away about a year and a half ago. And I was in the rehearsal and he was doing the opening of Beatrice and Benedict, a very complicated overture. And one of the French horn players has some sort of stylistic performance practice question because Maestro Montgomery was obsessed with that. And Kenneth said something on the podium that I've never heard conductors say, which is, I don't know. And I went, harumph, how can harumph, harumph, how can the conductor not know? But then I saw everyone just sit taller and play better. Now he came to the next rehearsal with volumes of information, <laughs> and that that to me was life changing. That I can be myself, but my choices have to come as a curator of this art form, not to be boxed in by it. But we are curators, mm -hmm. and we are there to to do what the composer puts on the page first, and then discover what that staccato means and then discover what that rubato means, and then discover what that forte piano means. But first we must do what's on the page, that respect, that honor that, that, that they put down on there. So I always start with that, and if I don't, I, I spend so much time, so much time trying to know every single corner and every single nuance, and why it's like that, and, and performance practice stuff from, you know, talking to composers today to researchers that I'm much about composers who have passed. So it's coming from that point of information so that when I'm eight, if, if I can't translate it with my stick, which is my goal, I better have the right words. Right, right, very successful with that, yep. yeah, it's excellent. And that um, brings up another topic that I've never heard before. And um, you had said with Puccini, everything's on the page. Everything. Do not add anything. Nothing. I have never heard an opera or a symphony kind of symphonic conductor. Everything's say, there. Right. The maestro and his editors have all put it there. The second that we get in the way of, of these markings or don't observe them correctly, it falls apart. For me, the architecture falls apart. Right, right. The right. intent of the storytelling. You know, it's the same with the singers on stage. You must get out of the way, especially Bohem, which is a perfect piece. There's not one 16th rest that's out of place. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, another great example of a perfect piece is Carlisle Floyd's Of Mice and Men. There's not one note, not one note mm -hmm. that is out of place. Mm -hmm. It's perfect. <laughs> Butterfly, you can say, mm, because Puccini struggled with that his entire life. You can see where he's like, ah, I can feel it in my arm. You know, that, uh, that transition, <clears throat> it doesn't make sense. You can, this is not bad. I mean, it's still magnificent, but right. you know, there's not what, nothing out of place. Just get out of the way. Yeah. Let the maestro and the words and the sound speak. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah. And then another thing, like we've talked quite a bit about, um, and I know I can get in the weeds with this, is is that Puccini's <clears throat> detailed articulation and extra musical notations are phenomenal. Like in this hard part here, I. I it's rare to see that kind of detailed instruction. Uh, you know, Debussy, I think you had mentioned Massenet. Massenet. Um, you know, I, I made up a huge long list in every single act, you know, where he'll have like three or four different notations, an accent, but with a staccato and a tune or whatever, you know, even the word vibrato with a harp, <coughs> yep. a low harp A flat, yeah. you know, so it, he's so detailed. It, for me, it's like the harp part sings off the page, if that makes yeah. sense. Like you could hear it when you even look at it, you don't even have to play it. And it's our job as harpists to pay very close attention very to that. Close, it's absolutely. not just the notes, it's not just the dynamics, no. especially with Puccini, and I think especially with Well, Puccini. I think it's with all composers, even mm -hmm. outside of the opera pit, mm -hmm. is that everything is related to intent. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're talking about pit conducting and pit playing, um, 
all those markings are related to the words on the page, what the singer is doing. All those markings have something to do with relating the sound of the harp to the pizzicato and the bass, or the sound in the harp to the, the bow speed and the bow attack of the first violins to get that same length, that same sort of color as much as one can possibly do, mm -hmm. you know, as these composers paint. So it's, um, to me, everything is related to the words. Everything, because that's the way the composers did these operas, is they first were inspired by the text, and that inspired the sounds. You know, you think of Britain. Mm -hmm. Every single, he, like Puccini, like Mozart, like Carl Floyd, like Jake Hagee, like Massenet can capture the heartbeat of a moment. It's not just notes. Mm -hmm. It's this dramatic moment of that we're having right now when we we're talking, mm -hmm. you know, this conversation. And it's a responsibility of everyone in the pit to um, observe that and honor that. And when you have a, a composer like Puccini, who is so pedantic about giving you the information this is a loving, glorious um, uh, sound in the in the duet of in the first act duet, whether it's the first act duet of Tosca or first act duet of Butterfly. The harp is just the sonorous propulsion of love, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And to uh, just observe that and get out of the way, yeah, yeah. get out of the way. Do not Let, take time. It's not a solo. No. <laughs> it's the, we want the yeah. audience to say, "What just happened? That was so beautiful." Right. It was these little nuggets. Yeah. Little nuggets, little gems of, of moments in time. So it's more verismo, as we say, right? It's right. real right. instead of hitting us over the head and broadening things where we don't need to and become so operatic. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then it destroys the sound in the orchestra, by the way. Right. right. If we indulge on stage, well, then we lose the sound of the harp. It, does, it can't sustain that long. Right right yeah. or the sound of the strings or the the winds are holding a note for too long right, right. there has to be a, and this is for singers as well when i work with them yeah. knowing what is underneath them right yeah excellent that sounds so good we won't go into great detail about all the <laughs> different articulation except that vibrato it happens in act one the very the very first four low a flats i think it is yeah. I'll have the word vibrato under it. And I know we talked about it. It's like, we, we're, you're not supposed to reach up there and create an actual vibrato, but just like some kind of specialness that you add to it, right? Right. And then the ones when she, Mimi's dying. Right. Again, low A flats. He writes vibrato over mm -hmm. all those little octaves, you know, the, with the pizzicato bass. You know? It's so, the same thing that I'm obsessed with, with the word is espressivo. Mm. But what were we doing before? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. No. Especially espressivo. <laughs> what were we doing before? <laughs> I think it's it's signifying. I want this to be sonorous. I want this to be present. I want this to fill the void. Mm -hmm. um, I want this to be a part of that that time of that matches the dramatic intensity of the stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, it's really just, just beautiful, beautiful writing. I always when I teach orchestration classes, you know, I always give Debussy and Ravel. I'm going to add Bowen yeah. after this because it's uh, it, we can all learn a lot from it. Um, so shifting to the harp in general, I mean, you've, you've um, conducted so many different operas. Like, do any stand out that have significant harp parts that you really liked, or? Well, I mean, just from before coming to do this show, but I might did uh, Lucia de Lamamore. Oh, yeah. And there's a huge harp cadenza. Yeah, yeah. D major or E flat, do you know? D major. Yeah, it's mostly <coughs> D. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me, frog. Um, yeah, so that that's uh, mm -hmm. an amazing thing. And again, that's just not notes on a page. That's just the Salzedo cadenza that everyone does, right? It's not just that, but it's introdu introducing one of the most iconic characters on the stage. And her quirkiness and her obsession with ghosts and her her mental instability is in the sound of this harp, right? Right. The crystal nature of her, she's so fragile and young and susceptible to all these awful men who are trying to control her and you have this sound this crystalline fabulous sound coming out of the harp yeah, yeah. that um, Donut said he does so well you know I mean he was someone when you look at the few times that he does use harp I mean he was the master of the melody but such a very lazy composer you know he just yeah. turned out his 72 operas very quickly just to get the bucks with all due respect 
totally wonderful storytelling, but at like times, even when you're like, mm, you could do a little bit more because there were so many great moments um, in, in that in that piece. Um, but I digress. But no, there's there's that. Um, a lot of this, this Massenet, yes. I, I can say Massenet 55 million times. Yeah. Um, I do a lot of Jake Hagee stuff. He always uses harp and the big stuff he does, Moby Dick, <clears throat> Great Scott. Um, and that is, he's a pianist. You can feel that in the harp part, uh -huh. you know, keeping that rhythm section going on. Right. Yeah. I mean, there are moments where the harp shines, but. Yeah, for color and yeah. kind of rhythmic propulsion. Yeah. 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 And, and again, Puccini does. Both he does those. the same thing. Yeah, he does them sometimes at the same time. Which Britain? Love. Britain, brilliant. Yes, absolutely. All the Britain. Yeah. Britain does not. Oh, does not what? I mean, I mean, he, and it's there for rhythmic propulsion, but he, each instrument, I've only, I've not done the big Britain pieces, just uh -huh. the small chamber ones, where each instrument, even in the big piece, when you listen to them, Peter Grimes, yeah. they're their own characters, you know? Interesting, yeah. They're yeah. their own colors and I mean, characters are just not part of a, the harp, the clarinet, the flute, the violin section, all have some individuality about them uh -huh. that works in the symbiosis. Mm -hmm. I, I had a chance to do Curly River. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. Was but I've never done any of the big ones. Just seen, you know, Peter Grimes is one of my favorites. Yeah, but this, yeah. the chamber ones are delightful. Turn of, oh, no, I shouldn't say delightful for Turn of the Screw. Yeah. Like story. <laughs> Who I did with um, Allegra Lily, who's the principal oh, yeah. at mm -hmm. Houston. Mm -hmm. That was magic, mm -hmm. um, nice. magic sounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. If I can add two of my favorite ones, because they're non-conventional. Um, I love playing Wozzeck. Yeah. Uh, for many reasons, even though he does include a low B, mm -hmm. which is, doesn't exist <clears> in the <throat> harp. So at the Met, they actually use two harps. But uh -huh. when I, I did it in Spoleto in Italy, and I just tuned one of the strings down, which meant that I didn't have access to right. one of the notes down there, but but it's just such inventive language and mm -hmm. use of harp with everybody. And then in Puccini's Soir Angelica, yes. towards the end, he lets the harp be the poison. Yeah, like we're always love, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and heavenly and all that stuff, which is fine. But uh, when she drinks the poison, da da da, da da da, that's just the harp, and that was always my favorite moment in Soir Angelica. Yeah. So anyway. To do something a little bit different. I love it. Um, so, okay. Um, for all aspiring opera harpists out there, what kind of advice? I know we've already talked about, you know, breathing and good rhythm. Are there any other pieces of advice you might have for them? I think listening to rep. I think being constantly curious about things that are outside your comfort zone, you know, because you never know when you're going to get that call to do a Broadway show even to do Sondheim, oh my God, how wonderful would that be, right? Yeah. So always being, opening your, your heart and your mind and, and to exploring things that are outside of what you know, mm -hmm. so that, because that always adds color and always adds um, new ideas to your own playing, the, whatever you do, whether it's Nutcracker for the 50 billionth time, right? Right, yeah. Listening to Wozzeck and learning yeah. from that and studying it. and. Yeah. You know, the myriad of different options for Lucia, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I do the original, room. by the way. Oh, unless wow. The, yeah, unless the conductor yeah. requests something yeah. else. But I just, I like doing the original. I do yeah. change a, a one pattern coming down, but I do the original. Anyway, yeah. I, I digress. Yeah. Absolutely not. No, it's just it's opening <laughs> your heart and mind to other things, you know? And yeah. The most important thing is always having that inner pulse, which are easier for you guys mm -hmm. to, to, to do that um, and to breathe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The concept of breathing, yeah. you know, which informs the release and the sound and everything yeah. that comes out of the instrument. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Yeah, so it was very helpful. Um, so, uh, lastly, what's next for you? We're just curious. What's on your plate? Um, I do uh, a new one-act opera, a very short one, um, with Jake Hagee. Uh, we do that in Seattle. It's a chamber opera, Seattle, San Francisco, and Chicago. Mm -hmm. And then I go to Brevard, where I spend my summers, and I'm doing um, Flight, which is an enormous hard part. Mm. Super hard. Mm. The piece is really hard. And then um, in my the opera season there, I'm doing Flight by Jonathan Dove. My colleague Stephen White is doing Bohem, and then I'm doing uh, Three Penny Opera. And that's the so, nice. Yeah. And if people would like to find you, are you on social media? I'm on social, Joseph Mekovich Conductor. That's okay. my, on yeah. Facebook and, yeah. I can't remember what I am on Instagram. I think it's Joey Mech. 
Okay. Something like yeah, that. Yeah, probably if you put your name in. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, we greatly appreciate you taking time to speak with us today. Again, I just find your presence, your preparation, your sharing knowledge, your you know, conducting everything just to be so inspiring. And I definitely wanted to sit down with you for a few minutes. So thank you for taking well, the thank time. Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's been an absolute pleasure. And I hope that we have a chance to work together. Absolutely. Again. That would be That'd great. Be great. So. Enjoy Orlando. Yeah, thank you. And I hope to see everybody in Orlando June 16th to 19th for the American Heart Society's 2024 conference, which was postponed twice. So <laughs> it was supposed to happen pre-COVID. So we are so excited. And again, there is an orchestra audition workshop with um, Anne Hobson Pilot and Abigail Kent, not to be missed. So thank you for joining us. And thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.